Today's lecture will be delivered by Dr. Uma Sinha Dutta. She is a global training manager at G Healthcare. Dr. Uma's research experience includes molecular virology, molecular and structural characterization of segmented RNA virus, early detection kit both for immunodiagnostics and RT-PCR. She is an expert in surface plasma resonance technology, especially GE's BioCore certified trainer and in cell analyzer GE's high content analyzer. In the next two lectures, Dr. Uma will explain the concept of surface plasma resonance technology by using BioCore technology platform. She is going to provide you not only basic understanding of how SPR works and how the Bayako technology platform works, but also a brief overview of applications possible and how to process the data, analyze data and interpret in meaningful manner. So, let us have Dr. Uma Dutta Sinha's lecture today. So, you all had um, a chance to look at the beer core. Um, we talked about some of the um, SPR uh, technologies, how it actually determines the interaction you know, the, based on the surface plasmon resonance technology, right. You know what is the association phase, what is the dissociation phase, uh, regenerations required, right, to run the cycles. So, yeah. post that, uh, you know, I would like to talk about a uh, little bit on the assay development part. Uh, you know, when you are ready to uh, do your uh, or start up with your beer core experiments, what are the things that you would like to, you know, take care, you know, when you have two interactants and you would like to see the interactions, what are the things that you would like to optimize, you know, which one should go as a ligand, which one should go as an analyte, you know, various other things, um, what would be the reference service like, you know, uh, things like that. So, um, let us start. Uh, so, this is the basic um, assay development. Before I do that, I just uh, I would like to spend a minute uh, to talk about the organization that I work for. So, I am part of G Healthcare and I work for a small group called Fast Track. <coughs> Fast Track is actually a, a group which offers services to the customers. Uh, there are two parts to it. First is the process development, the other is the training and education. And I am currently the uh, global fast track train, uh, training manager. So, I take care of all the trainings that happen globally and fast track like I said it is a global organization. It is located strategically over the world and you know we do all kinds of process developments on and training. So, coming to the uh, objectives of uh, the lecture. So, like I said we will talk about uh, on the assay development part what you would do when you first would like to set up a beer core assay. Uh, you know, uh, what are the optimizations that you would like to do, what uh, you know things like which one to what first of all what, how are the you know as first the assay how does it should lo it look like, uh, then which one can be a ligand, what can be your analyte, uh, what are the different reference surfaces that you can do you know and very important also uh, we talked about regeneration how do you optimize the regeneration condition because you know if your regeneration is not perfect your runs typically do not go well, so well right. So, um, the first so let us look at uh, some of the um, assay formats. The first one is the direct binding assay format which is very simple uh, you know your your interactant is actually immobilized on the surface like you can see here. So, we talked about in beer code that you have a ligand and a li analyte right whatever goes on the surface is called the ligand and whatever is flown on the on the flow cell is uh, called the analyte. So, in the direct binding your ligand is actually covalently linked to the surface and your analyte is moving on top right. You also have another uh, direct format it is um, nothing if we call it an enhancement or it is also similar to the capture method right what we were talking about. So, the first the capturing molecule is immobilized then you actually bind my your ligand and then your actual analyte comes and binds right. So, this is we you can also call this an enhancement molecule sometimes if your 
uh, if you are treating this as a direct binding, if this molecule is extremely small, then you can use an enhancer, you know, a specific molecule that it binds to read it. Uh, in the direct binding cases, your uh, sensorograms would look something like this. In, in this type, you, this is where your baseline is, this is your association phase and this is your dissociation. And if you are looking at and after that you can actually do a regeneration for this type only. But if you are looking at this enhancement, what you do is actually first this is where your red molecule is binding to your li ligand and then your enhancer is binding. So, that is your final response that you look at right. <coughs> there are certain indirect bindings that you can do uh, where we use it, um, we utilize the competition. Uh, so, the binding does not really happen on the surface, you are having the binding happening on the in, in the solution right. So, this is called the solution competition. What you do is here um, you mix the analyte and the detecting molecule in a particular por uh, portion. Uh, the analyte is kept constant where in with increasing concentration of detecting molecule ok and you mix them. So, with the increasing concentration of detecting molecule what will happen is you you will with increasing concentration of detecting molecule you will have free detecting molecule in the solution right. And then when you put this mixture here. So, with the increasing concentration of analyte, you actually see drop in response unit right. So, it is actually a reverse you know with increasing uh, usually in the direct binding with the increasing concentration of analyte, you see increase in response unit. Here you are seeing just the opposite right. Uh, this is another one, it is a similar format. Uh, so, here you are actually having a uh, competition in the so in the term that you are you, you are having a competition in the solution. The bound ones, the bound ones will not come and bind here. Only the free detecting molecule are available to come and bind, right? Now here, when you uh, you, you are mixing it with, uh, um, so this is where we call it is a surface competition. The competition is happening at the surface. You have the analyte as well as you attach or link your analyte with a competing analyte in the sense it is a high, high molecular weight analog where you link it with. And the key is the high molecular weight analog when you attach it, the, the size of this should be considerably larger than your analyte. You mix them, here they actually in earlier case the binding was happening in solution, but here of course, there is no binding. When you put this mixture on 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 your surface where your uh, uh, you know ligands are bound, you see the binding only because of your competing analyte ok. When you have these analytes are so small and negligible you do not get to see your binding. So, here too with increasing concentrations of your analyte you actually see less and less of binding. So, it is again a reverse plot right. So, if you summarize the response versus analyte concentration in direct binding you see increase in RU with analyte, whereas in indirect you actually see a decrease in binding with your. So, these are basically two uh, types of yes sir. So, so, on the direct um, enhancement, is that how are you going to get um, the, the rate constants on that? Is, or isn't that dependent on the rate of the enhancing molecule? Why is that? That is that's right. So, you you probably will not get the rate constants there. You can only do only certain applications like concentration determination. Oh, yeah, uh, that is a very good point yes. So, you uh, so, these are different various formats that are offered, uh, but then again it is limited to what applications you are using too yeah ok. Coming to uh, the general steps of Beaker assay, I think I do not need to explain that uh, you are all now quite uh, comfortable with this, you understand this, but we will talk about now in detail on the surface preparation why uh, you know. So, surface preparation, so when you have a uh, set of two uh, interactomers right, you uh, you would like to use it in be core to see and bind it right. So, you need to first understand why you would like to which one you would like to choose as a ligand, which one you would like to choose it as a uh, analyte things like that ok. So, first of all what is immobilization? We all know right, how do we stick it to the surface? 
we covalently link it, right? It is not just any attraction, it's, it's covalent linkage, right? So once you immobilize, that is, you know, immobilized for good. You cannot strip it out, okay? So when once you immobilize something on the surface, you can't strip it out, right? So points to consider, you know, first when you have it, which one you would like to immobilize? Then how you would like to immobilize, which chemistry are you going to use, whether you are go, going to use the direct binding approach, you are going to use the indirect binding approach, all these things, right. What is the immobilization level you would like to use, okay, because when different applications require different immobilization techniques, uh, amounts, right. So for example, in kinetics, you know, adding too much of ligand is extremely detrimental, you do not get a right kinetic data, your ligands have to be immobilized very, very low. Whereas if you are doing a concentration analysis, you need to have a high ligand concentration. So these knowledge is very, very important, okay. And which sensor chip is suitable for your assay? We talked about various sets of um, sensor chip like you know, CM5, CM3, uh, C1 when you have a lot of non-specificity, hydrophobic for HPA, you know. So all these things, NTA for nickel tagged if you have something like that, okay. What to immobilize? We come back to the question of which one to immobilize. So the first thing that you would like to look at is actually the molecular weight of the interactant. Which one should you, th would you think should go as a ligand? If you have two interactants and one of them is large and one of them is small, which one would you like it to go as a ligand? The small one, absolutely, because you can use the larger one as an analyte, so you get an, you use a, you know, higher response, you know. But having said that, uh, with the beer code T200, the sensitivity it offers, even if you have a smaller, uh, you know, small molecules can still be used as an analyte, but you do see some amount of um, background, you know, a noise, uh, but then it is still enough to do a, uh, you know, kinetic analysis, but not with the earlier versions like X100 where the sensitivity was not as high with the T200. Tagging of the interactants. If you have a tag, you would obviously like to use a capture method to put it in the, as a ligand, right? Functional groups. The few things, uh, functional groups and binding activity uh, of the immobilized, they go together actually. Because if you are using a functional group to immobilize, which is actually in the active pocket, then, you know, you destroy the activity, then you you know, then there's no point, right? So you need to um, have some amount of information of, you know, the functional group that you're using and that is not being used to, you know, immobilize it on the surface, right? Purity. The most pure one should go as a ligand, you know. You cannot have an impure ligand. The more junk you immobilize, the data go becomes more dirty. You can still use it as an analyte, you know, so, of course, again, in, in a, when I talk about analytes being impure, it's only limited to applications like binding experiments. If you have to do kinetic, you cannot have, you cannot afford to have an impure analyte. But if you're doing a concentration analysis, if you're doing a binding, it's fine to have a slightly impure analyte. <coughs> valencies. The more number of uh, valencies, where do you think it should go? It should, it sh uh, you know, the, so like an antibody and an uh, analyte uh, or uh, so you, you use uh, anti beta 2 microglobulin today, right? And uh, beta 2 microglobulin as an analyte. Which one did it go uh, on the ligand? The anti, the valency was 2. You put that on the surface, right? So, but if you had done the opposite and Okay, so the question is if you have an antibody on the uh, surface and have an analyte on the uh, flowing on the surface, it is actually a one is to one binding because we call it as, uh, you know, the binding is considered with respect to the analyte. But if you have the antibody on the, on flowing on the thing and, and your analyte, the same detecting molecule is on, on your surface, then it becomes bivalent analyte, right, the bivalent analyte. So your mode would change. PI of the protein. PI of the protein, I would like to slightly stop by out here and we, we will explain it in uh, greater detail one in, in the upcoming slides because that you will see is an extremely important when you're immobilizing your ligand.
okay amount of available obviously if your amount is very available is very little then you know you would rather use it as a ligand because when you are using it as an analyte you have to you know run various number of cycles leading to more number of uh, you know requirement of uh, analyte and then um, assay requirements of course assay requirement is very very important what actually do you want to get out of the result that is very important too <coughs> surface preparation i think you saw this slide you you know uh, surface can be prepared in two ways one you directly immobilize the ligand right the in the other one you actually capture the capture your ligand so your in capture you are actually capturing molecule is actually immobilized directly on the surface now the difference would be is that you know in this case uh, you you lose the directionality of your ligand like we were discussing so it is actually immobilized at random using you know any of the free amine groups or the thiol groups on the surface whereas if you are using a capture molecule you maintain a directionality of your you know ligand if if you if you are say requires so this one that you're looking at is is actually the step of your immobilization so how do we immobilize is like you know first we activate our surface using edc nhs and don't ask me what's the full form because i really cannot remember ever uh, the edc nhs it, it what it does it actually activates your surface uh, into a the carboxyl groups into a reactive ester group okay and that's where you're seeing the edc nhs is being pushed after that you know at this point your surface is actually activated and then you push your ligand okay with, with which has the free amine groups or the free other other groups and at this point all your proteins are getting covalently attached or linked to the surface okay and then finally you do a blocking with ethanolamine the this blocking is to block all the activated ester groups which are not which has not formed a covalent link because if you do not block at that stage when you are actually passing your analyte they may come and bind there right so this blocking step is extremely important and the difference from here to here is actually your immobilization level okay choice of immobilization strategy it will depend on your ligand again uh, amine coupling is very widely used uh, you know in in most cases you know more than 90% of the cases we, we typically use amine coupling uh, particularly in uh, proteins when we are talking about because there is huge amount of pro, uh, amine groups available in most proteins uh, right uh, so if we, if your pro ligand is actually unstable then you would actually use a capture method right if you if you are if you are using a covalent chemistry to immobilize and your ligand you know loses its activity then you would rather use a capture method if it's an impure ligand like remember you we said that your ligand needs to be very very pure to be put on the covalently linked on the surface but if it is an impure ligand then you can do is capture it right so you can only capture the uh, your specific ligands <coughs> if your covalent linking actually loses the pro, uh, you know results in loss of activity say for example you have done amine then you and it loses the activity then try and use a uh, thiol coupling or aldehy aldehyde coupling for acidic ligands typically you know capture chemistry is is mostly used and if regeneration condition is also uh, you know difficult like if you have not found out a regeneration condition sometimes it is very difficult to find out regeneration condition for some cases in those cases also you use capture chemistry okay okay coming to the pi uh, point which is extremely important here when you are immobilizing your ligand and I think I do not need to reiterate uh, this you know we all know what is the you know uh, what happens when your um, uh, when your protein is put in a pH less than your pi your protein is actually positively charged right and if it is more than your pi your protein is actually in negatively charged so when we use this so it is the same thing in, in a more schematic uh, thing now the pka of the surface the care the, the, the chip the pka of the surface is actually um, close to 3.5 okay so if you are going less than uh, ph 3.5 uh, so i'm talking about a scenario where i would like to immobilize my ligand and i would like to put my um, 
ligand or the protein in a certain buffer where it is in a particular charge, positive or negative, let's, let's decide that, right? So if I put my protein in a pH 3.5, say most likely if the protein, of course, PI is higher than that, it will be positively charged, but the surface actually loses its charge, okay? It, it has absolutely no charge. So in that case, you know, there is no attraction between the protein and the surface. And why are we talking about the attraction between the protein and the surface? Because we talked about covalent linkage, right? But the covalent linkage to happen, the, uh, the protein has to come close enough to your surface to, so that, you know, covalent bond can be formed, okay? So this scenario where your pH is l very low, typically it's not a good scenario to immobilize your ligand. You do not see uh, immobilization. So it's too low for immobilization. Now at a pH higher than 3.5, you know, your surface actually attends a net negative charge. Okay, and if your PI is higher than that pH in, a, in that particular pH and you are able to keep the protein positive, you know, then your attraction happens. Okay, and this is the ideal scenario where your, uh, you know, covalent linking can happen very ideally. Again, if your pH is very extreme, uh, higher than your PI, you know, the, then there is no attraction because both of them becomes negative. So uh, that's what we call it as pre-concentration also. So when we are doing a ligand immobilization and sometimes we see that we are not attaining the amount of RU that we are expecting, uh, this is something that is extremely important apart from the chip quality and EDC quality and things like that. So the, this is also something very important to keep. And um, this is the same thing that we uh, talked about. Now, uh, you know, not all the time you may have information about the correct PI, right? Uh, so we have a tool called uh, scouting, pH scouting, which actually let, tells you which buffer would be most convenient or ideal to use it for immobilization buffer, okay? Uh, for immobilization purpose for that particular protein. So you can take a little bit of your protein before you do your actual immobilization and run into this pH scouting experiment, okay? Uh, take a small amount and then mix it with various buffers. Typically the buffer uh, that we uh, supply is from pH 5.5 to pH uh, 4, okay? Mix them in all uh, different, con uh, same concentrations but different buffers and then run them. And then try to compare and see what is the uh, peak like. So remember here there is no immobilization happening. It is just the pre-concentration, only the attraction that is happening and then you see the increase in IU out here, right? So in this case that you can see that pH 5.5 is the lowest and the highest is pH 4. So what does it, what do you think it means? That Does that mean that pH 5, uh, 4 is the best for immobilization? So most people uh, think, you know, that, you know, increasing the, the more uh, lower the pH we go, we can attract the protein more and eventually we can get the best. And, well, there is some amount of truth in that, but not always, you know. So if you see out here in pH 5.5, which is actually kind of like the highest pH here, you attend quite a large amount of RUs, okay. You go to around something like I can't even see 10,000 RUs, which is an extremely huge amount of RUs. You don't need that much amount of proteins to, you know, if, if you are reaching around 4,000 or 3,000, it's more than enough to, you know, do you, any of your uh, applications that we are talking about. Now, so we actually did not get enough information from there. So we took the same, uh, same thing and we ran it through the whole immobilization process, right? And you see in uh, pH 5.5, you get, you get to around 13,000 RUs, right? And pH 5, you get to around close or maybe similar. I don't think there's, I mean, 13.5 and 12.6, I think I would say it's very close to each other. 4.5, there's a reduction. It's much less. And then again, 4, it's even less. So whereas our pre-concentration earlier showed uh, you know, with 4.5 and 4, it was still increasing. But here, actually, you are actually attending a much lesser RU than in, uh, considered to pH 5 and pH 5.5. The, uh, 
logic out here is actually so when you are actually attracting so much in pH 5.5 increasing the p uh, lowering the pH even further and attracting does not really help for covalent linkage. So, that is where you start getting your steric hindrance and where your you know immobilize your covalent linkage is not again uh, you know happening in an ideal scenario. So, the key thing like uh, she said is to have your proteins in a comfortable environment close to where your p, uh, proteins will be comfortable not stress them out in uh, you know in harsher condition. If required if you do not see any rise like for example, in these cases if you do not see any rise in pH 5.5 and 5 and suddenly you see a pH rise in uh, 4.5 that is where you go into a low uh, you know lower pH like 4.4. 4.5 or 4. Otherwise, stay close to uh, you know more comfortable environment. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, uh, I think somebody was asking about the immobilization level. So, this is so how do we uh, find out the immobilization level and in, in beer cone term and how much should we immobilize actually when we are doing a beer cone assay. So, we have this formula which we call it as uh, it's a, it's kind of like a, what do you say? Vedvakke in beer core. Uh, R max is equal to molecular weight of analyte by molecular weight of ligand multiplied by R L into the stoichiometry. So R max, uh, we haven't talked about R max yet. R max is called the maximum binding capacity of your surface. Once you immobilize your surface the capacity of the surface to bind maximally your analyte that is your R max ok. R L is the ligand immobilized ok. So, when you immobilize your ligand you get a particular R u right. Say for example, you immobilize 500 R u or 1000 R u right. So, that is your R L and stoichiometry of your binding whether it is 1 is to 1 or if it is a bivalent it is 2 right. So, typically theoretical R max what we did find out from here is higher than your experimental R max. Usually when you actually immobilize your ligand you tend to um, you know lose some activity you know and or your uh, ligand to begin with may not have 100 percent activity. But in some cases when you see much higher um, R max you know in experimentally as compared to theoretical. Uh, immediately it should strike a bell that uh, a bell should ring in your mind that something is wrong either the stoichiometry that we considered was not right uh, or there is some non specific activity or there is uh, aggregates happening right. So, there is a small exercise if you would like to do hopefully it will wake you up if you guys are sleeping. So, for a, say for example, if we have a ligand uh, that I would like to immobilize and I would like to work at an R max of 100 ok. And the molecular weight of your analyte and ligand are given. So, your ligand looks like a map like 150 kilo Dalton, your analyte is 25 kDa, stoichiometry is 1 and I would like to reach an R max of 500 right. So, how much R L, how much of ligand should I immobilize? Anybody? 600 right. So, if you get 600 then typically I would since your theoretical R max is usually higher than your um, you know experimental R max we typically go ahead and if it is 600 from your theoretical I would go ahead and immobilize 700 or 800 to compensate a little bit and then you know start your experiment ok. Is it ok? Right, yeah. So, uh, so if you are doing a kinetic analysis, you have to be uh, even 100 RUs is quite high sometimes. Sometimes you have to go as low as 50, 20, or you know, T200 actually allows you to work as, as low as 5 RUs, R max, ok. So, you can still get a very decent, nice, uh, no, uh, without noise uh, graph, which we can perfectly. Um, do an evaluation on get and get a k a kd value of it. Um, if it is a concentration 
or affinity determination, then you it has to be on a higher range. Like you know, uh, when I say higher range, it can be around say three thousand to five thousand, ranging on that. So you you find out the surface saturation. Uh, Say for example, you know, if you are uh, immobilizing a 150 kDa molecule, so your surface saturation comes at close to around 10,000 to 15,000 RUs. Okay, that's the surface saturation. Yeah, roughly. Uh, so, and if it is say around 25 uh, kDa, then it is around uh, 2,000 or 2,500. That's the surface saturation. And when you're doing a kinetics, you should never be in a saturation mode. You uh, you know there, there is something called um, mass transport uh, limitation that happens which actually affects your concentration of your analyte. So, you would have to keep your ligand concentration extremely low. So, uh, otherwise you get erroneous kinetic results. How much will come when you say 600, 700 what's the unit? RUs, resonance unit. Re response unit. Intensity. Yes, exactly. So, like I said, right, we, it is related to the refractive index. So, the change in refractive, in, uh, the change in mass will change the refractive index, and that is related to your response unit. Response unit. Because the the molecular weight is not different, so we have two unknowns. No analyte molecular weight. Oh, okay, okay, there is. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it can allow a lot. I mean, um, and then it, it's not about T two hundred allowing it. It's the um, the analyte and the uh, ligand molecular weight which will contribute to it. Yes. Five are use of R max. Yes. Okay, so I'm sure this was very informative lecture by Dr. Uma. You are convinced that she is able to convey the very hard ideas and principles involved in this technology in a very lucid manner. In the next class, Dr. Uma will continue to explain some more detail of Bayer core technology. She will also provide a demonstration and working of how to do SPR experiment on Bayer core platform in the next class. Thank you.